Hello economic students. Hey, over the past several class periods we've been talking about GDP, gross domestic product, and of course that word product is related to the word productivity, and that's really what GDP is measuring. It's measuring our nation's productivity as measured through dollars that are either spent through the expenditure approach of GDP or through dollars earned through the income approach to GDP. But it's worth taking a minute here today to just look at this word productivity, product and productivity, in a little bit more detail. And let's explore why some countries ha are more productive than other countries. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get into it. Here's a definition of productivity. It's the output of goods and services measured per unit by labor, capital, or land. We can measure our productivity uh, based on productivity per unit of capital or productivity per unit of land or natural resources. But usually we measure productivity um, through labor productivity. That is, productivity is how much output can be generated by workers per hour or per unit of, of, of labor. When productivity increases, more or better products are produced with the same amount of resources, that is, the same amount of labor, capital, or land, those productive resources that we've talked about a lot. So, let's get into it. What causes productivity to grow? Well, there are institutional structures built within a society which will have a direct impact on how productive the society is. And I've listed major institutional structures here. Property rights. Uh, if you have strong property rights that are protected by your nation's government, that will be a very positive thing for productivity because people have a reason to be productive if the fruits of their labor, their property, will be protected. The same goes with patents and copyrights. You'll have much more innovation if people are can, can patent or copyright their intellectual property, the, the product of their own creativity. Uh, that will lead to greater productivity if we can protect our own uh, creativity and make sure that we can earn money from what we create as opposed to others making money off of your creations. It's very important to have efficient financial institutions. We need to have banks that are strong, stock markets that are strong and that are fair and that are not going to go under very easily. Uh, there was a time in our nation's history when our banks weren't as efficient as they are today and money that was put into a bank was not as protected as it is today. Nowadays you almost never have a large bank go bankrupt, uh, go out of business. It's possible but we have strong financial institutions that make that much less likely and the money that you have deposited in these institutions or the money that you have invested in the stock market is safe. Education, of course, is an important factor. A more educated population will be more productive. Free trade. By free trade, what we're talking about is the ability to trade with uh, internationally uh, and to trade internationally without uh, restrictions to trade, such as through uh, excessive import taxes or other barriers to trade that nations could put up. Since the end of World War II, uh, there's been a, a strong movement towards freer and freer trade, and as a result of that, uh, we have had uh, an increase in productivity as we have to compete with foreign producers. And in competing with foreign producers, we have to make better stuff. And foreign producers have to do the same. And really, everyone has come out ahead because of it. The, the wealth of all the world, or most of the world, has really improved uh, since World War II. And much of that is due to the loosening up of trade and, and, and implementing free trade as opposed to restrictive trade barriers. And that's directly related to the last item here, competition. Competition helps companies to have a reason to always look for ways to increase productivity to get greater output from each unit of, of resources that they have to use to produce things. It forces companies to be efficient, in other words, and to uh, make use of their resources in a very efficient way, uh, and that lowers prices for consumers. Okay, so those are our institutional structures that cause productivity to grow. There are also supply factors involved in productivity growth. 
The quantity and quality of our natural resources has a big impact on economic growth and productivity. The United States is blessed with very, very uh, productive natural resources. Our climate is basically very, very good. We have extremely good soils that, that are helpful for farmers and ranchers. We have lots of minerals. We have very, very high quality natural resources. Europe does as well. Interestingly, China, which is about the same size as the United States, they do not have really the quite the same quality of natural resources as the United States does. China has a more harsh climate. They have much larger deserts in China. Uh, they have higher elevation, which produces a harsher uh, climate than what we have in the United States. So we're really blessed with our very, very uh, productive natural resources, both from a quantity and quality standpoint. The quantity and quality of, of human resources is also important. Uh, that is, you again, that relates to what we talked about earlier with education. Uh, we want a highly skilled and educated workforce. And I have this picture up here at Hamburger University, which is a real place over in Oak Brook, Illinois. Um, this is a, a, an organization, Hamburger University, that is owned by McDonald's. McDonald's puts a whole lot of emphasis on training the people who are going to run a McDonald's restaurant. Um, so, you know, it's not just the universities that you think of, but uh, many large American corporations put a lot of emphasis on the ongoing training of their workforce. And then finally, capital goods. Uh, the quality of the capital that is used into production is also extremely important. Believe it or not, these two pictures that you see here uh, are basically engaged in the same activity. One picture on the upper right I took several years ago when I was in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. That uh, gentleman is making false teeth. But if you look at that, he's using a, a a drill that is powered by his foot. It's a foot pump drill. Uh, and then you have another man that's doing the same thing in the bottom photograph. He also is making false teeth or dentures. And uh, you can imagine that the capital that is being employed in the bottom picture is going to produce much more quickly and much more uh, quality in uh, the uh, dentures and false teeth than the one in the upper right. So uh, again, the quality of capital goods is hugely important. And finally, technology improvements. Uh, we're always seeking ways to improve the efficiency of our production. And uh, for example, uh, here you see a diagram that is illustrating uh, uh, hydraulic fracturing as a means of producing natural gas and crude oil. Uh, now, there are problems with hydraulic fracturing uh, that sometimes is called fracking. but Nevertheless, it is a technology that's enabled the United States to uh, regain its position as the number one crude oil producer in the world. Um, so technology is important. Uh, when you do have these kinds of technologies, though, it's equally important to minimize our negative externalities associated with them. And there are negative externalities associated with, with hydraulic fracking, um, which is something that uh, oil companies, I hope, are working on. There are also demand factors. We've discussed the supply factors. The demand factors. Uh, you have to have customers, basically. Households, businesses, and government must purchase what is supplied. So you have to make sure that you're supplying things for which there will be a demand. And if there is no demand for the products, then you know what's the point? So there are definitely demand factors involved here, as well as the supply factors. So let's look at a few other things that contribute to economic growth. Efficiency factors. Uh, productive efficiency means that you're going to use the resources in the least wasteful way. So you see here in this photograph, it's in the alley back behind a restaurant. Uh, is showing a lot of inefficient use of resources. A lot of food here is being thrown away. That we don't we don't want that to happen. We want to make sure that when we're employing resources in production, that all of those resources will be used and not being discarded and wasted. Um, definitely uh, uh, an important concern for any business. 
and then allocative efficiency. We want to make sure that the resources that we are using are used in such a way that it is going to maximize their utility. Remember that word utility. The utility means the degree to which something uh, satisfies a need or a want. You know, we could use gold theoretically to pave a road like you see in the bottom left. Is that really the best way to allocate that, that very scarce resource? Probably not. Uh, it's much more efficient uh, to allocate gold into the use of jewelry and other uh, fine things like that. So allocative efficiency is, is extremely important, making sure that we're using the resources in such a way that the utility that we get from them is maximized. And finally, I want to look at what's been going on as far as productivity growth. And here I'm looking at the United States real GDP per worker. And look at the trend on how productivity per worker, this is labor productivity, has improved since uh, 1947. And this takes us up to 2017, um, you know, right shortly before the COVID uh, hit. Uh, it would be interesting to see a, an updated graph like this, but you can see the trends in the increase in labor productivity. From 47 to 69, uh, average labor productivity increased 2% per year. It slowed down in the 1970s, and that was an interesting period. In the 1970s, there was a rather dramatic increase in inflation, as well as in, well, especially in the price of crude oil products. And that did have a negative impact on worker productivity. Uh, then in the 1990s, you see that worker productivity increased pretty strongly, up to 1.5%. Oops, sorry about that. Let me get back. So worker productivity increased in the 90s, and I think we can largely attribute that to uh, the uh, implementation of the you know computer technology, much more widespread, and ultimately the internet came into play. So think about how it used to be you would have to mail a document across the country, for example, uh, if I sold something to someone in Los Angeles and they needed to sign a contract, I would have to mail that contract through the U.S. Postal Service, and that would take several days. Now, I email the contract, and it's there instantaneously. So internet technology has really improved the speed with which we can produce and sell and implement, you know, and implement those sales uh, across the globe. And then you can see uh, after about 2009, uh, when we had a recession, actually beginning about 2008, there was a recession, worker productivity decreased. It, it then increased rather rapidly after the recession, but it hasn't quite gained its uh, level of growth that it once had. Uh, it would be interesting to see how uh, this will play out as we get this graph updated, probably before too terribly long. The trend here, though, that I want to make sure that you understand is that worker productivity has been increasing pretty dramatically uh, over the years. Finally, related to worker productivity, let's look at the average hours per worked, uh, excuse me, the average hours worked per person in various countries. Notice the trend in nearly every country, these are developed countries, is down. So what does that mean? Even though worker productivity is increasing, that enables us to lower the hours that we have to work. We're, 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 we're not having to work as long of hours as we once used to have to work, and we're still getting the same kind of output or even better output, even working fewer hours. Now look at South Korea there. That's an interesting graph. South Korea had much more hours being worked per person for many, many years, but ever since about 1990 or so, they too are working fewer and fewer hours. And there's lots of statistics that show that once a nation hits a certain level of per capita GDP, the workers want to start enjoying the fruits of their labor more, and they refuse to work as long of hours as they previously worked. What's the point of working, after all, if you can't enjoy the productivity that you are that you are responsible for? So highly productive societies tend to work fewer hours. And that's a great thing. That means that we have leisure time, and there's a lot of value to leisure time. And that's something we're going to discuss quite a bit over the next day or so. Leisure time is a hugely, hugely important element uh, that is enjoyed by highly developed, highly productive societies. 
that's something that we didn't have before. Uh, if you looked at the United States 100 years ago, people didn't have much leisure time. Now we do, and the reason we do is through productivity, and that enables us to enjoy our lives more. And with that, I'm going to stop this presentation. Check Canvas to see if there's an assignment. There might be. I don't remember. Y'all have a great day.